All righty. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Dine Around Downtown Cooking at Home edition. This is our second season, and we're so happy to be back. We had three featured restaurants at the beginning of the summer, and we are very happy to be back this fall. I can't believe it's fall, uh, bringing you three new restaurants. Uh, so thank you for joining us. My name is Ron Dijon. I am the event manager for the Downtown Alliance. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Downtown Alliance is the business improvement district for Lower Manhattan. And uh, what we do and have been doing for 25 years is helping to make downtown a cleaner, safer, more vibrant place for people to live, work, and play and visit. Uh, and that includes providing support to local restaurants um, and local businesses. And so this series that we're providing to you guys today is part of uh, our continuing efforts to provide support to local restaurants. Uh, and in this case, uh, their chosen food security charities that, um, that have all been impacted by COVID-19. Uh, now, you guys at home can help too by donating to City Harvest. Uh, City Harvest is the food security charity chosen by today's featured restaurants. Uh, and I will go ahead and provide you the link to them. You can go ahead and donate when you get a chance and uh, anything helps. This is their direct link to their website. Uh, so go ahead and help out whenever you can. Uh, so just a few housekeeping things before we actually begin. Uh, we want to let you know that this cooking demo is being recorded. It will uh, be sent to everyone who has signed up for this program. Uh, so we'll send a link that, about that tomorrow um, via email. Uh, regarding Q&A during the demo, if you have any questions for our guest chef or our host, uh, you can submit them to the Q&A feature, which should be if you're using a desktop or laptop on the bottom of your screen. If you're using an iPad or tablet, uh, you may have to tap it and then it usually appears on the top right corner. Sometimes it's on the bottom, depends on what you're using, but just tap the screen, you should be able to see a Q&A box. Um, now, uh, the chat box is, as I've been using, uh, will be used for us to share helpful links, webinars, and any other details uh, and information throughout the program. Uh, like this one I'm about to share with you, this one is our poster plate contest. Uh, and our poster plate contest is, uh, oops, there you go. Uh, this is a, a chance for you guys to win. Um, a session, a 30 minute private virtual cooking class with our guest chef tonight. Uh, and all you gotta do if you're cooking at home uh, and following along today, or maybe trying it over the weekend, you can post your plate on Instagram and uh, you'll be entered to win this 30 minute private virtual cooking class. Yep, <laughs> so great. Now, uh, let's get started, shall we? So uh, I am so happy to be introducing this next gentleman. He was our fabulous host for our first season of Dine Around at Home, and we are so very happy that he is back. Uh, please welcome your host, award-winning chef and author, Rocco Despierdo. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the fourth edition of Dine Around Downtown at Home Edition. Uh, it's, it's episode number four. It's mid-September. You know what that means? That means New Yorkers are surviving <laughs> and thriving in spite of obstacles, because that's what we do. When, uh, when the governor says New York tough, this is what he's talking about. We're figuring out how to get it done. And uh, Chef Matthew will help us get it done today with his demo of a delicious dish of Rohan duck. Um, I want to thank you for, for joining us. Uh, as Ron said, the Downtown Alliance uh, is over 25 years old, and it, and it is a public-private partnership between business owners and the city of New York. And they raise funds and advocate and uh, create policies that help protect us uh, as we live and thrive and, uh, in this case, try to survive a pandemic in New York City. Um, I'm very excited that today's charity is City Harvest. City Harvest is the, lar the largest privately owned food security charity in New York City. Uh, they focus exclusively on uh, New York City and their output has increased about tenfold during the pandemic. So their, their needs and their clients' needs are greater than they ever have been, greater than 2001, greater than 2008. This is uh, 
a new high mark for food insecurity. We're looking at about a 38% food insecurity rate among all New Yorkers right now. 38%. Think about that. That's one in three people or one, two and a half people are, are food insecure at this moment. So any funds that you decide to donate, I promise you, will go to a good place. Uh, Chef Tom Kalicki and I have been City Harvest board members for over 25 years. We've both been in the field. We've seen the good work that they do. Uh, we've helped them raise the funds. We were just at a board meeting last week uh, discussing their new facilities in Brooklyn. They're really doing a wonderful job uh, advocating and serving uh, New Yorkers in need. So please feel free to be generous with this one especially. Uh, you can help out uh, by supporting City Harvest uh, and the link, the link that you need to click is going to be in the chat box. Um, I am very excited to introduce you to Chef Matthew Dahlkemper, who uh, I just have to say this right now, whose email is Chef Liverkick. He'll get into why that is his email in a minute. It's very interesting, very fascinating. You know, most chefs are one dimensional. We, we spend all our lives cooking and learning how to cook and often don't perfect more than one craft. Uh, and I'm going to let him tell you all about his second craft, the, the one that he's per, per, perfected over five times uh, with belts to prove it. Uh, and he is the chef of Temple Court in the beautiful Beekman Hotel. They are getting ready to, they have uh, their rooftop open right now, which is absolutely gorgeous. They're getting ready to open uh, to the public indoors as well as of October 1st. And today he's making a Rohan duck uh, cooked over bin shotan, my favorite cooking method, with figs and fennels. I, I won't delay it any further. Please allow me to introduce Chef Matthew Del Kemper. Chef Thank Matthew, you. how are you? I'm so good. Thank you. What a beautiful Thank you setting. For Thank you. Yes, our lovely rooftop, and I uh, appreciate the fantastic intro. Uh, so yeah. uh, we're here today to talk a little bit uh, about some of our dishes and what we're doing here. Uh, we recently opened the rooftop around three weeks ago. Um, we've seen a tremendous demand, and um, Lower Manhattan has been very, uh, very happy to have us back. So glad to be here and talking to, uh, to you and everybody from Downtown Alliance. Um, sure, it's can... more important now than ever to go and support the restaurants that are brave enough to be open. It's a very small percentage of restaurants that are reopening uh, because it is very challenging. So please go to Temple Court, have dinner, tip 100% and be very proud of it. Right, Matthew? <laughs> yes, and uh, my servers would appreciate that tipping 100%. <laughs> <for sure. laughs> Looks like you got a Bin Shotan uh, Conroe Grill fired up for us. Yes. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, charcoal and kind of what we're doing today. Please. So um, if you can see here, uh, we have a few different uh, kinds of wood and charcoal. Uh, I know that a lot of you at home may be cooking with gas grills. Some of you may have, you know, a little Weber grill. Um, these kind of and we don't uh, like gas time. grills right chef Get, gas grills are for amateurs we're not fans uh, you and i are no we are not fans i agree no. i agree with you if you're cooking outside not. it's got to be wood or charcoal tell them why yes. uh definitely uh wood or charcoal is the only way to live jose can you get a close-up here so um we have a few different kinds of wood here so this is oak wood the binchotan or pak pak charcoal this is some random apple wood chips and then these are your uh um, uh, charcoal briquettes. These are terrible, uh, and I only put them here so you guys understand what not to use. Uh, these are laden with chemicals. Uh, they instantly light uh, when you touch them, whereas this guy, if you light him, it will take, you know, five to ten minutes for him to actually get lit. Um, it's a process um, a little bit more patient than, say, using this, which uh, for me, your food just tastes like chemicals, and uh, any restaurant that uses that, uh, suspect at best. Uh, but today we'll be using a combination of these two, uh, and I have a little bit of the chips that's soaking here in water. And the reason that is, is that if I were to put those chips in dry into the fire, uh, they will just kind of uh, ignite uh, almost instantly. Uh, live flame is, is completely different to cook on than... Uh, gas grill which is very steady heat uh live flame is a moving thing and 
in terms of your heat and your temperature and uh, how you cook completely depending on the product that you cook. Uh, the thing I love about these charcoals is that they get very hot, they stay very hot, uh, and they don't they don't steam like normal charcoal. They um, they will maintain their heat for a long time. Even sometimes I use them at home, and um, I'll cook dinner on them, and then the next day they're actually still they're still hot. They're still lit, even though I've wrapped them in aluminum foil. Um, so they maintain their heat very well. And don't don't be but afraid I'll, to I'll research Big uh, Japan. It's available to the public now. You, you could buy Pot Pot Charcoal on Amazon. You can go to Corin.com or Mutual Trading Kitchen, and they all sell what's called Bin Shotan, different grades. Uh, it, it may look a little more expensive than your standard briquettes, but as Chef said, it, it cooks hot and lasts a long time. Some of these uh, Bin Shotan charcoal can cook for five hours, and they're also uh, made from smokeless white oak. So there, there won't be the smoke that you're used to uh, when you're cooking with wood or standard charcoal. So a lot of benefits to it. Not to mention the flavor, right? 100%. The flavor is, is really great. Those of you who are living in lower Manhattan, uh, definitely you have corn, which is right there on Warren, um, which has a variety of different kinds of uh, charcoal, different kinds of vintage time that you can use. So fantastic store for picking that up or you, know, you can just always order it off the internet uh, but let's let's get into it so I have my charcoals which have been lit and uh, here they're pretty uh, they're pretty worn in at this point you know you see that they're fully white and uh, they are ready to go and at this point before I I have my ducks tempered I'm gonna take a little bit of the soaked wood and I just kind of pepper it in in some of the corners. And the reason I don't dump it over the top is because I don't want to extinguish my flames. I want to get a little bit of that wood flavor, um, but I don't want to, I want the, the wood smoke to kind of come slowly. And so we soak it so that it is not going to kind of incinerate as soon as we put it into the grill. And then, you know, over a period of a few minutes, you'll see, start to see that wood smoke coming up very, very gently. We have two duck breasts here. These have been tempered uh, for around a half an hour. And what we do at the restaurant might not be exactly what you do at home. We brine them for 24 hours. Um, you can, depending on your salt ratio in your brine, you can for a little bit less, a little bit more. In the restaurant, we do it around 16 to 24 hours. We then rinse them from the brine pat them dry, and we actually let them dry under fans for around two days. So our- Chef, you know, if you don't mind, could you explain? Chef, if you don't mind, could yes. you explain the process of tempering? Uh, it's something most professionals do, but I don't think a lot of home cooks understand why, why we do it and what the benefits well, are. Absolutely. So uh, we temper it to get it to room temperature. If we are, let's say I have a, a nice ribeye, for example, if I'm putting the rib on a nice one and a half inch out of it's going to take longer for it to pan at home. It's going to kill the temperature of my pan. Uh, so that tempering, it's it's a it's a more even transition of cooking versus going from cold straight on, onto whatever your cooking surface. Um, we do that again. So the duck breast. I can take start to finish on this grill as opposed to doing this in the oven. It also avoids uh, that like bullseye said, this, look that, we, that a lot of people get. That You know that bullseye, yes. Chef, where it's rare in the center or Definitely. raw and then well, well done uh, and rings all around. Yeah. Yeah. We, that's not what we're going for here, right? So uh, we let these dry as well for two days. And you can see that the skin is a little bit tacky. And that's actually kind of what we want. Uh, because we brine it, it tends to take in a little bit of the moisture from the brine. Uh, so getting that really, really dry will lead to a crisper skin. Uh, and also the grilling process, if I were to go with these ducks that were not dried, they tend to steam a little bit more and excrete a little bit more water. So we dry for two days. Uh, if you wanted to make this dish on a Wednesday for your Saturday get together at home, that's kind of how I'd recommend it. Do you have to brine it? Do you have to dry it? 
no, you don't have to. You could skip that step completely. Um, but, you know, for me and the restaurant here, uh, we tend to do that just because I think the final product is a lot. I think these these are the Let's steps that are precisely I'm nice and these are the steps that are precisely what makes restaurant food so much more special than home cooked food. A lot of people ask, how do you get your food to taste so good? It's all these little extra steps that we take, uh, the brining, the tempering, the drying that really add to uh, the the final flavor and and texture. So it's all all it's an investment in flavor uh, that if you have the time for it, you should definitely try. Hundred percent. So we've put our ducks on now, and uh, I'm, I actually use a weight uh, to press the ducks. I find that, you know, you will have a little bit of uh, the skin start to curl, uh, the same when you do a fish, and that steady pressure, you would think that it actually uh, presses the juices out. It's quite the contrary. It actually leads to a much crisper uh, skin, and uh, that's kind of what we're going for with duck breasts. If you can see when I put it on as well, uh, my flame is not roaring. It's not uh, in a very intense heat. It's kind of, it's a steady, low, lower heat. And the reason that being is that we want to render the skin of the duck. We want it to get crispy. If I go too intense, I'm gonna have this layer of fat in between the skin and the meat of the breast. Uh, and we want to avoid that. We wanna get that skin, uh, all that fat nice and crispy and kind of cooked down so we have a little bit of texture on the end. So you don't be afraid to apply a little bit of pressure. I like to do this a lot with fish. Uh, I do a lot of fish at home on the grill. Uh, salmon and Arctic char are probably my two favorites. Um, but there's a lot of fish that you can do skin on on the grill and it can be a bit intimidating for I think the home cook. But man, the, the end process is really, really fantastic. It's also important that that the rack is hot. If you go onto a cold rack, it may stick a little bit. Uh, the duck breasts, fortunately, are pretty fatty, so we might get a little bit of leeway with them, but cooking other things like poultry, uh, like leaner cuts of poultry like chicken, or like I said, fish, you may have, you may run into a little bit of problems with that. But Chef, did now, you score the breast, the duck breast? We did score them, yeah. So after- You did, time, okay. We, yeah, we score them mm -hmm. to get a, that proper render on the skin mm -hmm. and get that guy nice and crispy. And I think to your and, uh, point about the grill, the grills, I've found that it's best not to wash them because they'll rust and lose their nonstick properties. I don't know how you feel, Chef, but uh, usually I just let them burn off. Whatever's stuck to them, I allow it to burn off and never really put soap and water on it. No, I, I don't either. Actually, usually when we're done with the grills here, I just kind of tap off the excess stuff or you can even just kind of take a light, uh, maybe even just a light brush if you have a lot of caked on debris. But most of the time, um, they tend to get a better coating once they're not washed and they have a little bit of that residual fat on them. They, they also, almost, they're like a cast iron pan. Same kind exactly. of concept. Exactly. So I'm definitely with you on that one. So we see we have and, a nice- And uh, where, where uh, can we get these ducks, Jeff? Where can we so, buy these ducks? Uh, definitely in New York. I've seen them at uh, Chef's, uh, or sorry, Brooklyn Fair. Um, mm -hmm. The one on 37th and uh, 10th. I've seen them there. Um, I'm sure that you can probably find them at Whole Foods as well. These are from D'Artagnan. Um, I'm not sure, don't quote me on this, but you might be order, also order, be able to order directly from them. Um, yes, they sell, they sell to consumers now. So you can go to d'Artagnan.com and, yeah. and order it. It's a special hybrid of uh, mallard and pecan that they make. And uh, it's really delicious. So you can see now I'm starting to get a little bit of color. <clears throat> but you see it's very white still. <clears throat> and you can Beautiful. see this is that layer wow. of fat underneath it. So we want to get that layer of fat to shrink down. But again, he's not ready yet. So you can move your ducks around a little bit. You can see that because of how I have them grilling, I'm getting a more intense cook on this side and not as in intense on that side. So I'll just kind of move them around a little bit. But again, this is a very slow process. Uh, let the render happen very gently. If you go over intense heat, um, it, it's, not, it's just not the best for 
uh, for this process of cookery for duck. There's definitely other cuts that will be more suited to more intense quick heat, but this one is a slow steady process. The nice thing about doing so ducks like this is that um, I can also use my, my grill to heat up some of the other elements that are going with this dish. Uh, and I can kind of stand here and I can drink beer or whatever your cup of tea is and just kind of stand there and, and watch your duck. What are, what are you serving with this duck, Chef? So we have a uh, fig mustarda uh, and all the recipes are attached. Um, so we have a fig mustarda. Uh, we cook the, the figs down with a little bit of uh, shallot. Uh, some Madeira or port, um, and then we puree it and then fold in pickled mustard seeds. Now at home, you could you could uh, omit that step if you wanted to. Um, we are going for more of a finesse finish look with the sauce, so we want that smooth coating on the plate. Um, if you want to do it at home, you could just chop up the figs and go and kind of have a more rustic look, but it definitely, I think, uh, adds some aesthetic uh, when you have that silken, that silken kind of puree on the plate and that's your end product uh, with some of the mustard seeds folded inside. That's the pureed one. So we Beautiful. The, 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 it's also pretty easy to find mustard uh, of all kinds now in uh, grocery and, stores and online. And other read now and that Yes and, and right now you know we have figs which are kind of coming towards the end of the season here. But uh, there's a lot of different uh, fruits or other varieties. Actually, prior to this, we were actually doing cherry, uh, plum. All your summers are a great option here. Um, as you go into the winter month, obviously, you have your um, duck a orange, very much classic that we were doing here. A few more months, Kristen. We have this, uh, so the fennel we just caramelize in the pan and we deglaze the pan, get a little bit of color on the fennel, deglaze it with a little bit of chicken stock and then simmer it down and finish it with butter. Um, can't go wrong adding butter to things. The two things I learned in culinary school is that fat and salt make things taste good. If you live by that, I'm sure that your food at home will be delicious as well. So a little bit more color now. You can see we're starting to get where we want, but we still got a little bit ways to go. So not a rush here. Every once in a while, you may need to move the ducks around on the grill. If you see that the heat is, is not quite uh, the same in every spot. I tend to line my grills with a little bit of aluminum foil just so uh, it's just easier to clean up later. Uh, you can just put the, the charcoals directly in there. I like, I like them in there just so it's, it's nice and neat for the next day. We tend to cook our ducks uh, around mid-rare to medium in the restaurant, based upon obviously the guest. Uh, anything beyond the medium, I think if the duck has too tough of the texture. Uh, it's not really ideal. So uh, that's what we shoot for. It's not like a chicken where you can't eat it uh, medium rare. Um, it's actually, for me, the design way to eat it so to consider as you're cooking your ducks at home. Chef while your ducks are cooking can you uh, please tell us what the significance of your email handle Chef Liver Kick is. I alluded to it in the introduction yes. but I think it's now now time for you to spill the beans. Now it's time all right so uh, throughout my cooking career um, actually as long as my I've had a cooking career I've also been into martial arts. Uh, I have a few different black belts that have competed in MMA. Hold, uh, hold on, when you say you and, have a few uh, different black belts, most of us dream of just getting one yellow belt. You know, usually that dream is, is over by eighth grade. So tell us about your black belts and how long it took to get them and what, what you had to go through to master all these, these wonderful uh, martial art crafts. <laughs> yes, uh, so I have uh, black belt in Jiu Jitsu. Uh, that one took me around 11 years. Um, I got that from the Nogueira brothers, uh, currently changing, training with uh, Renzo, Renzo Gracie in uh, New York. Um, very much looking forward to when 
that opens again because it's been closed since March. So very sad about that. Um, I also I started more traditional martial arts in Hapkido, uh, which is kind of uh, like judo mixed with Taekwondo style striking with a lot of joint manipulation, much more meant for street defense. And um, some gyms, they tend to give belt accreditations um, for this. Uh, technically, I have uh, something for Muay Thai, even though Muay Thai typically is not a belt system. Some schools do it as a way to promote internally and kind of give some recognition. Uh, so that was through the Noguera Brothers in Dubai. And are you and, doing these simultaneously or, or uh, does each one take its own decade? Through most, career, I, through most of my career, I've done them uh, simultaneously and uh, competing in MMA. Uh, as I've progressed up the food chain and the culinary world, it's been harder and harder to maintain it with the hours that you work. Uh, definitely when I was a line cook, it was a little bit easier, but uh, now it's becoming more challenging. My last fight was around three years ago. Um, Match and I so, won that so this is what you would match. call this is what you would call mixed martial arts. Is that correct? I think the the chef told me earlier mixed. that this is MMA, mixed martial arts. So it's basically Mar grappling Mar with with the, fine martial arts all mixed uh, together. Anything goes. Right. Exactly. Uh, that's, there, I, that's the majority of my good. competitions have been a mat. Yeah. It's exclude. Yeah, I'm still here. Did I? Am I? I am I with you? No, no. It, it's the smoke. I think that that is covering you a little bit. So, you just oh, step okay. away. Great. Oh yeah. Now I can see. There you go. Smoke yeah. a little bit. And you told me one interesting tidbit that yeah. you've never been finished in yeah. a ring. Tell tell everybody what that means. So I have lost, uh, both of which were very good wrestlers and by decision. Uh, so I have not been knocked out or submitted in competition. Uh, that's not to say that that hasn't happened plenty of times in the gym. Uh, or in the kitchen. That's definitely happened lots of times. In the gym. <laughs> happens, but, happens every day yes. in the kitchen, right? Yes. 100%. <laughs> so day. that's, so, so think finished is when you... Voluntarily tap out, right? When you say, "I give up, I can't, I can't do it anymore," and that's considered a takedown, yes. right? A, uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, basically, yeah. got it. Uh, well, the take the takedown is basically the transition from stand up to the ground, and then you have submissions, whether that be by choke or some sort of joint manipulation. Um, that usually, if you don't tap, that you will either probably black out or you will. Uh, break or tear an ACL like I have done. Amazing, well, my God. Uh, Chef, if you could ask your cameraman just to hold the camera still so we can see the beautiful brown and even uh, cooking on, the, on that skin would really be helpful. Yeah, can you just get a close up? It really looks absolutely delicious and I might, yeah. so I might come much. by for some later. You should. I'm not sure if you can hear this, but nah. the skin is really crispy. My girlfriend likes to yes. make fun of me that I take most of my Instagram stories of me tapping on random animal skins and showing their crispiness. <laughs> but uh, they have had a proper render at this point, and you can see how much thinner that the skin has become. That white layer is cooked off. And now I just yeah. want to uh, take them a little bit longer. Now, I need to back up a little bit. So now, again, we're still... Uh, going very, very slowly. Uh, I don't need to rush. Uh, because these ducks are a little bit thinner, I can take them start to finish on the grill, uh, especially because I've tempered it. It shouldn't be a problem. I normally use this cake tester to test uh, the ducks uh, uh, at home. No. If you don't have to Chef, tell everybody about the cake tester. This is something we've all used in kitchens for over 30 years. Uh, cake tester that you would normally use to test cake batter in the oven, we use to test doneness of meat and fish and poultry. Uh, could you, can you get a close-up of that cake tester so everyone can see it? This is a $3 tool that will make you cook like a $500,000 a year chef. 
if he's uh, if his camera is still for a second, I can explain it. It's uh, it's, it's exactly. literally is, a piece uh, of metal. Yes. So that is something every cook in New York City has in their pocket. It's a piece of metal with a small plastic uh, holder, and you insert it into the fish or meat, and then you bring it to your lips or to your the back of your hand to to see how hot it is. And chef, when do you when do you determine it's hot enough for a piece like a piece of duck like this? Uh, for a piece of duck, you can lower it back down. Fish for a medium rare. If it's you don't really want it to be hot. If it's hot right. to the touch and you take it out and tap it yourself, uh, it's totally gonna be. Uh, so if, you, if it's hot, if it's hot to your skin, that means it's hotter than ninety-eight degrees. For a medium rare, just here in the in the meat. Exactly, and we want it to be warm, um, like a very, 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 probably warm bath. Um, maybe. Maybe not like that one, but. I just want to really so bring we'll this home for those people kind of watching. I'm this so case tester like can literally change the quality of your cooking from amateur to serious pro. This cake tester has been used by uh, chefs like Tom Colicchio, Eric Repair, Daniel Baloud, Jean-Georges Van Gerichten, David Boulay, all the greatest chefs rely on a simple little cake tester to determine whether something is cooked enough. When it comes to fish cooking, it's an extraordinarily helpful device. And chef, if you could show them how to use it exactly, it would be really helpful because even those who have one and work in kitchen don't seem to know how to use it all the time. Sure. I'm just going to move my ducks to a colder part of the grill so now they can rest. So what yeah. I do with the cake tester and the, uh, we can get a close up here is I want to stick it directly into the kind of the fat part of the meat. Okay. And it should go. It's very, it's pretty sharp. And we just want to leave it there for, you know, two, three seconds. And then as I remove it, I'm going to tap myself here or a more temperature zone is here, uh, but obviously not too, not too sanitary for restaurant conditions. But so we'll, we'll temp it right here. Um, now, and it won't, here and is, it won't is just leave the meat out, which is important. It's small enough to give you a temperature read, but not large okay. enough to drain the juices from the bird. Typically, if I'm doing it at home, this is the most, uh, the zone, this zone right here is typically the most sensitive and you can feel it almost instantly right below your uh, lower lip. Exactly. And like, uh, like you alluded to earlier, any kind of meat, whether it's a steak, so many people I've, I've heard, they ask me all the time, well, how do I know when the steak is done? Uh, you know, typically yes. at home, I just cut it open. I cut it open a little bit and I look inside and this is <laughs> like, oh my no, God. No, you, you don't. Know? Stop lying. You don't <laughs> yeah. do that. Stop lying. <laughs> Not me personally, but I've had people that yeah, uh, have Yeah, but most that. people do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But this little cheap thing, uh, also you can use a, a simple wooden skewer to the same effect uh, is a fantastic tool. If you don't have a thermometer, um, honestly, I would say probably in the kitchen, in most professional kitchens, these are the two most common utensils. Uh, of course, the knife as well, but uh, those two are your workforces. And you're using your body as a thermometer. But, your body uh, is you look, always 98 degrees. So if the, the cake, temper, cake tester is hotter than your body, then you know it's 99, 100, 110 degrees. If it's cooler than your body, you know it's below 98. And I just have to tell them about one little uh, one little trick. If you, you can't find this cake tester, I have found that if you take apart a Chinese takeout container and remove the wire, you can straighten out the wire and then wrap the wire around a Sharpie at the top and create a little handle. And that wire works really well. And those are free since you probably already paid for the roast pork fried rice. Well, her, uh, yeah, I know you're going to get a chuckle out of that, but they, but it does work. Ah, definitely, definitely. And uh, these little things elevate your cooking at home, give you a little bit more confidence as opposed to probably over a little bit. Uh, the reason being is that this side of the grill is still warm, but it's not hot. So I want to rest my duck before I slice them. Uh, so that they don't bleed out and they have time for them to kind of settle cooking. 
they will continue a little bit cooking once I take them off the heat. But now I've moved this off and they're just kind of in a, in a warm zone, staying warm, but they're not necessarily cooking. In the meantime, I'm gonna get all my other things hot. So uh, we have the uh, poached figs, which I take the same cake tester and just poke it in the bottom. Now, whatever you want, uh, we do our poaching liquid with herbs and a little bit of Madeira, uh, but you could do it in chicken stock. You could do it in any of your favorite wines. You can add sugar, you can add salt. Um, whatever kind of flavor profile that you're going for, you can have a lot of fun if you're going for you know, high decadence, you can do it in, in butter if you're feeling that fancy as well. Uh, but we do it with a little bit of uh, Madeira uh, just because that goes pretty well with the flavor profiles of this dish. So my ducks are resting. Everything else is just kind of getting hot. I've already cooked my fennel. Uh, so the nice thing is, is that if you're doing this at home, you can kind of be... Uh, you know, if you're doing this outside, you don't have to go inside and check your pot kind of right here. So I'm just letting That's this- That's terrific. So you know, the, remember the grill is a, is a source of heat that you can use to cook anything as the chef is doing. He's making that grill multitask for him. You don't need a burner on the side. For those of you who are buying grills and buying a burner to put on, to, to install on the side, it's not necessary. The grill is a great burner. You can put pots and pans right on top of the grill. And, and we do that quite often in the restaurant. And obviously sometimes when, when we're busy, we run out of burners. So then you have to kind of have to go on the grill. I've moved all my charcoal over to one side. So now it's sitting a little bit higher than when it was before. So it's even, even a better burner. I have a little bit of steam coming off my, off my fennel now, which has already uh, been cooked. And uh, we're just kind of pulling. The nice thing about these poached figs is that they can, you can kind of set them on a very low temperature and kind of forget about them. Uh, don't take figs that are very overly ripe. Uh, the overly, the very, very soft figs will be great for your um, mustarda. But for the poaching fig, you want something that's kind of not firm, not too soft, kind of in the middle. Uh, so it will maintain its body through the cooking process. And uh, you can kind chef, of set them Chef, in for those people who have missed the fig season, uh, are you okay with using dried figs in, in, so, as a substitute? Yeah, definitely. And now, you know, you're coming, we're coming into the fall. So, I mean, pear is a great alternative. Uh, you still have plums around. Um, I mean, any kind of mustarda, you, any, and, the, and the recipe that I have provided will lend itself uh, pretty well, omitting it omitting the figs for any kind of other fruit, especially as you go from into fall and into winter. And in winter, obviously, we started in the citrus and then into the springtime and then back into the summer when this dish will go really well with any kind of stone fruit that's still available. Uh, and so and any mustard any mustard will work because it's, it's about a the sweet brine. So and we have spicy some. condiment. Exactly. And uh, with the recipe that's there, I mean, it can kind of, you can kind of play it however you see fit. Uh, work the same with any other kind of fruit in the same quantity. You may need to adjust a little bit depending on the ripeness of your fruit. Uh, if you're adding sugar content, if you have very, very ripe fruit, it may be sweet enough on its own. If you have fruit that's maybe still kind of developing, then you may need to uh, play with the sugar content that's there. Terrific. And how do you cook your fennel for this dish? Uh, so this one, we just caramelize them in the pan. Uh, so this is fresh fennel sliced, I imagine, right? Control oil. Then we deglaze with chicken. Fresh fennel sliced into wedges. Uh, caramelized with a, a deglaze with a little bit of chicken stock. And again, you can add any kind of aromats that you want, any kind of fresh herbs. Uh, if you wanted to have a certain spice profile, you can put that in there. Um, you know, saffron or um, you know, chili, whatever you're into, uh, you, can, you can kind of go that, that direction. 
And the nice thing about this is if I sear it and I can kind of let it cook very slowly in the chicken stock, reduce it down to the point where it's just about finished, and then I add in a, a nice pat of butter and let that butter emulsify into the sauce. Um, it's, it's really, it's really great like that. Make sure you season that your sounds like heaven. Don't worry about, don't worry about seasoning the fennel like a piece of steak. Season it. That the food, do a simple one with chicken stock in the restaurant, um, and then obviously butter and, and seasoning, a little bit of fresh herbs. And so, if you've got really uh, fresh, wonderful fennel, you might even I'm try really slicing sure, it super thin uh, and serving it raw as a salad. Yeah, that's a great alternative as well. And uh, we serve. We serve this duck tasting menu is paired with uh, McCall. This one is a, actually a, goes very well with the duck. Uh, and then this, this particular uh, is, is what we're serving as a, a wine tasting for our current tasting menu. Chef, we talk so, about car caramelizing vegetables and meat a lot when we talk about cooking. Can you please explain to the audience what that means, caramelizing? So uh, what we do is when we caramelize is that basically is browning. So whether it's a piece of beef or it's a piece of fennel, uh, when we put it on pan or we put it on our grill or um, whatever, we want to have caramelization of the browning of whatever you're cooking. Uh, if it's a piece of steak, for example, if you had a piece of steak and your grill is not hot enough, it just kind of comes out looking gray, right? And then you don't have the texture of the caramelization. So it's important that you have, you know, obviously you're controlling caramelization through whatever your heat method is, whether that's via your burner or grill, whatever. Um, and we want to have that caramelization like these ducks, beautifully caramelized, nice brown color. The same with my fennel, which is here, have taken a little bit of caramelization. Um, that browning changes your texture. It changes, changes the flavor, flavor profile, depending on what your, uh, what the product is. And I think gen generally speaking, it just leads to a better and more desirable eatability of whatever your product is. Terrific Am stuff, thank okay you so time? much. And we're talking about Maillard reaction. When you're browning meat, you're creating something called the Maillard reaction, which is literally molecules of protein becoming sweet, uh, converting to sugar, which is why we use this term caramelizing. Uh, I think we have about 50 minutes to plate and answer questions. If you're ready to start slicing and plating, we'd love to see it. All right, very good. So, um, like I said, my ducks have, have rested. They're still residually warm because of where they're sitting on the grill. Uh, so I'm gonna take my ducks and I'm gonna slice them. I think I think this guy is the golden right here. So, so we're just gonna lay down a little bit of the, the starter in the center and make a this nice This is well. the fennel mustarda. Yeah. Uh, the fig mustarda, yes. Fig mustarda, got it. And then with the duck. Let's I see like that knife. It looks like a beauty. Side down, I find. Look at that. Probably Japanese. Very, very, very much Japanese. You can buy it at Corin. Also, the same place you get your charcoal. Uh, really worth the investment. Definitely. Uh, and definitely, we want to be, have a sharp knife here. I find that it's a little bit easier to go through the texture of the skin when the, the skin side is down. So I will, will slice. And going all the way through. <laughs> so notice he's pushing and pulling the knife. I don't know. He's not, not sure chopping if you can through. Pushing and pulling. Let the sure knife do the that. work. It was, it was. It was crunching as I was going through it, which is a. We heard it. We heard the crackling. It sounded amazing. So I just want to, I put them on paper. 
I put him on the paper towel just so he does not bleed out on my plate. And all your other garnish here, also on the towel, so they don't bleed out. And we can transfer our duck to the plate. Spreading a little bit of molding salt now. Now you notice that I did not season my duck before I put it onto the grill. The reason being is that the duck was so we have a certain level of concentration of salt already inside. Uh, we have sugar inside the brine, so the sugar is kind of acting a little bit as a preservative, uh, but and as is the salt, but the salt is imparting a lot of flavor that way. So we don't want to add, we don't need to add a lot of salt. We put a little bit of malding just for some of those finishing touches and then the remaining garnish there. there Notice all it. the precision, the paper towel, the, uh, the use of tweezers yeah. and tongs oh, and, and all these things make a big difference in presentation. And if you, uh, if you want to imitate some of these techniques, feel, feel free to use these at home. They will raise your game without question. And now that we're all cooking at home so much, uh, why, not, why not raise your game a little bit if you have the opportunity? Notice on the cutting board, there isn't a pool of duck we blood. We also put a That's little bit of Go ahead, Chef. Uh, we put also a little bit of fennel pollen just to uh, accentuate the fennel notes a little bit more. Um, that's just a nice finish. It also gives you a little bit of that yellow coloration, uh, which will kind of make your plate uh, another a little bit more color. Never hurt. And the same with Rocco, what you were touching on. Uh, the same is keeping having that rest because I allowed it to rest. It didn't necessarily bleed. The juices stayed inside the meat. Uh, the same with the fennel and my figs. They were dried off so liquid on, on the finished product. Obviously, when cooking in the restaurant, we're a lot more finesse. People are paying. They have certain expectations, especially when you go anywhere that has a tasting menu. Uh, but at home, these are just little things that you can practice to really elevate your cooking. Chef, there's some questions about the fennel. You, could you explain the process of, of cooking the fennel from the beginning to the middle a little bit more? You start off with fresh bulbs That's, of fennel, and then, and then yeah. what do we do? So I, I will, I'll cut the fennel into wedges, uh, like so. I can see how it is. Um, from there, I'll get my just neutral oil hot in the pan. Uh, once it's hot, I don't want it to be smoking hot, but once it's hot, I'll lay my fennel in there. And I actually, I like to press a little bit because sometimes when you cut the fennel, depending on how the leaves of the fennel open, they can kind of uncaramelize evenly. Uh, so a little bit of pressure, and then I'll just let that cook on one side till I have that nice proper caramelization and browning. Flip it to the other side, a little bit more caramelization, so it's equal on both sides. I'll take chicken stock then into the hot pan for that, and I allow the cooking, uh, the chicken stock to cook down. Now, it's very important that you have the proper size cooking uh, vessel, depending on what how much fennel you have. If you have one bulb, you know a pot that's about that big is going to be really appropriate. Maybe um, for that amount, you might need need a pint of chicken stock and as you would the, the chicken stock a little bit more intense and we want to have seasoning in the chicken stock already uh, as you deglaze the same way you would make a, a risotto so that your flavor is coming into the fennel as my chicken stock reduces my fennel should uh, start to become soft I personally like a little bit of crunch in the fennel that's just me personally you can take it all the way there if you don't uh, finish it on the stove. You can also put it into an oven proof, uh, oven safe pan and finish it inside the oven until it's cooked all the way through to your desire. At the end, uh, while the burner's on, just kind of 
keep it swirling, add a few pats of butter, and let it glaze down until it coats the fennel. Uh, and I find that that's and, really, and it's just a super simple, easy way to eat fennel. So you're cooking the fennel until it's basically tender, but a tiny bit toothsome, is that right? Yeah, that's, that's my own personal way to eat fennel. Uh, some people might like it kind of a bit softer. Cooked a little more, sure. Um, I like my vegetables. And how, how many bulbs, how many bulbs or yeah, how I many like my vegetables do you get out of one bulb? Uh, I mean, it's fully one dependent bulb of on- One fennel. Yeah, it's fully dependent on the size of the fennel. These guys that we had were probably about uh, the piece that's on the plastics of a bulb of fennel. So a dinner for three people, uh, one bulb of fennel will, should be enough. Got it. Uh, and there's a question about brining. If you maybe could share the, the percentage of salt in the solution, just to give people a, a quick sort of snapshot of how to make the brine. Sure. I think uh, the percentage of salt is really fully dependent on what you're brining, the thickness uh, of what you're brining, and the actual product itself. If I'm brining, let's say... Okay. Um, you know, a, a brisket, you know, I may need to leave it in the brine a little bit longer for it to take on that. Because of the mix, we go along, this recipe was off the top of my head, but um, that recipe gives a nice a juiciness to it. And as well, the salt is not overpowering. Sometimes you have too much salt in your brine, in your ratio, uh, it's too much. Typically what I do is, as I'm tasting my brine, it should taste like uh, and I think uh, depending on where you're from, you know, Northern Atlantic tastes a little bit less salty than say uh, some of the other bodies of water that I've been in, but not so much where it's like, Ugh, but you know, enough where it's like, okay, it's, it has a, a nice little bit of saltiness. So just taste your product. If it's too or heat. I've seen I've seen salt uh, brines that are as low as two percent, as high as ten percent uh, by weight. So if you were weighing, you know, a thousand grams of of water and you added a uh, hundred grams of salt, that would be a a ten percent brine. That that would be a very strong brine. Uh, obviously, the recipe is attached, and you all got the recipes in the emails. There's another question about someone uh, asking whether they should throw their gas grill away or whether the, the two can work together, the charcoal briquettes and the grill. Now, personally, I've used charcoal briquettes, briquettes and live uh, fire on a gas grill. I find that it helps light the charcoal. Uh, what do you say, Chef? Uh, well, I think, you know, obviously not all of us uh, are comfortable using uh, charcoal. Not everybody's comfortable cooking with wood. Cooking with wood and cooking with charcoal are also two very different things. Um, some people, they have gas grills. Am I going to tell you to throw it away? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, hey, it's, tell it's tell them grill, tell right? what you did with yours. Tell them what you did with yours. No, I can't, I can't say that on video. <laughs> okay, that that's right. Let's not talk about uh, it. We don't want to hit the fire. So, sometimes, you can, uh, yeah, sometimes you can, um, you can make some uh, changes and, and alterations. But the, the best thing to do is to use the charcoal on top of the grill, allow the charcoal to light up, and then put it underneath or put another rack on top of it and you'll get the best of both worlds. Yeah, and the same also, I think cooking with wood is really good on gas grills. Uh, depending on how your gas grill is set up, usually there are heating elements underneath. So you could put, for example, uh, different zones of your grill on the cook on and then have a lower temperature on, say, the far side of your grill that has a little bit of wood maybe in an aluminum foil pouch. So that, that wood is billowing out some of the flavor profile that you want in your product. The reason gas grills are not necessarily ideal is because they don't really impart flavor. They're good for caramelization. They're good for a steady heat. Uh, they're also good for the entry-level cook. Uh, as we progress and we want to impart more flavor and get different kind of um, notes in our food, whether that be through wood, through charcoal. Um, that's really how we do it. 
I mean, also there's tons of different wood. For example, this guy here is oak. Oak is probably my favorite wood to grill with because I find it to be the most versatile and it doesn't, it can kind of work well with anything. Um, what we did the duck in today, these chips, which you can find these chips pretty much at any grocery store. Uh, these are apple wood. Any kind of fruit wood, I think, lends itself really well to the duck. Um, stuff like uh, hickory uh, and mesquite, they might be a little bit too strong for a duck. Uh, it's all based upon personal preference. That's my personal preference. I think the fruit woods work really well with poultry. Um, but if you're, if you do have access to open fire, obviously living in that, you know, in New York can be a bit of a challenge for those of you who do. I mean, I know that every, my girlfriend, she gets very nervous every time that I'm cooking on the patio with the same grill that I have here. Um, it can be, it can be a little bit. Uh, Obviously you want to make sure it's safe. Always, but, always have a, uh, fire extinguisher around that's really important that's required by law when you when you cook uh with any kind of fire in professional kitchens it's a good idea to have one at home as well but please experiment this is a really lovely way to cook any meat or fish by the way the dish looks absolutely stunning uh if, if one of our viewers came in tonight and told you that they watched you cook this would you maybe send them a half a glass of uh champagne to go with that that beautiful duck dish. If anybody comes in and watch this, I will <laughs> I will take care of your uh, your email. Nice. There support. you go. Make a reservation at Temple Court. They are open for business and soon to open indoors as well. Uh, thank you, Chef Matthew Dal Kemper. I appreciate you sharing your life story about uh, mixed martial arts as well. It's it's uh, an unbelievable accomplishment while also becoming a great chef. Uh, you can make reservations for uh, Temple Court, I believe, on Resi and Open Table. You can follow them at Temple Court on IG. You can follow Chef at Chef Liver Kick on IG. And of course, Downtown Alliance is Downtown NYC. And of course, I am at Rocco Despirito on IG uh, for more information. You've got emails with, uh, with recipes. We'll send up follow up emails with all of your questions answered as well. Uh, Chef Matt's going to provide us with all the uh, answers to the questions that we didn't get to. And remember, all the proceeds and the, the time and resources, uh, the time and resources uh, donated to this event uh, go to City Harvest, the largest privately owned food security charity in New York City. They are doing an extraordinary job and really raising the bar uh, for taking care of and advocating for people who are in need in New York City. And again, it's 38% of New York's population. That's quite a lot of people. I hope you'll join us uh, for the next uh, edition of uh, Temple Court, by the way, is located in the Beekman Hotel at 123 Nassau Street in Lower Manhattan. You can visit their website, templecourtnyc.com. If you want to donate to City Harvest, go to cityharvest.org. Uh, the next, the next, uh, edition is coming soon. We'll be posting information about our next one. Uh, I believe it's the restaurant called Benares and also in downtown New York in Tribeca, one of my favorite Indian restaurants. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you then. Uh, in the meanwhile, try to cook this dish. Please post it on Instagram uh, and let us see what, you're, what you've accomplished so that uh, we can enter you in the contest to win a virtual cooking session with Chef Matthew. Uh, you can go to downtownnyc.com forward slash dine around to get information about our upcoming events. Thank you for tuning in. It's a real pleasure to share this time with you. Um, I'm happy to see New York uh, full of life uh, with dining al fresco now dining indoors. We're getting there guys. We're getting there guys. We need your support. Please come visit us in our restaurants eat a lot of food, drink a lot of wine, tip, tip as generously as you can. It really makes all the difference. That's how we will survive this, by, by you coming to us and participating in the process of rebuilding. I thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. I thank you, Chef Matthew, and thank you, Chef Tom Colicchio, for yeah. giving us access to Temple Court today. See you later, everybody. Have a great night.